This is the last lecture for Chapter 4, and here we'll look at the cytoskeleton. Today in lab you saw the amoeba moving, and the amoeba was doing so because of the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton was actually being disassembled and then reassembled as the pseudopods pushed forward. So the cytoskeleton is a network of interconnected protein filaments and tubules, and it goes all the way through the cell from the nucleus to the plasma membrane. We find the cytoskeleton in eukaryotes to give the cell shape, although actin, one of the components of eukaryotic cytoskeletons, uh, has been found in prokaryotes, and it uh, is also thought to help with cell shape. The cytoskeleton also is like a highway inside of the cell for organelles to move, and there are three types of filaments that make up the cytoskeleton. First are the microtubules. They're small, hollow cylinders. Their assembly is going to be controlled by a centrosome, and they are going to help to maintain cell shape and also as a highway for organelles and other materials to move. The intermediate filaments are intermediate in size, and they have a rope-like assembly. They run from the nuclear envelope to the plasma membrane. So here you can see the microtubules, these small hollow cylinders. They're made of a globular protein that's wound around and around. Imagine taking two necklaces and winding them around your finger, pulling your finger out and everything stays put. This is what we would see with the microtubules. And you see the microtubules as they are moving from the centrosome all the way throughout the cell. They help to maintain the cell shape and they act as a track for materials to move. The actin filaments are going to be uh, smaller, so they're actually two chains of monomers. Imagine two pearl necklaces that are twisted together and they form a dense web, and they're going to be found underneath the plasma membrane to support the cell. And here you can see that microvilli, which are these structures that extend from cells such as the intestinal cells, uh, they are supported and kept stiff with the help of these actin filaments. And the microvilli, of course, are going to increase the surface area, and this is why we find them in the intestines to increase nut uh, nutrition. The motor proteins are going to be instrumental in allowing cellular movement. Myosin is one of the motor proteins, and two of the others are kinesin and dynin, and myosin commonly interacts with actin. <coughs> so when we saw the, ame <coughs> excuse me, the amoebae move, or white blood cells move very much the same way, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this is happening because myosin is interacting with actin proteins. And myosin also does this uh, with actin to move muscles. Kinesin and dynin are two other uh, motor proteins, and they are actually like little cars that drive along the micro, microtubules of the cytoskeleton. These are the structures that I mentioned before that can transport vesicles from the Golgi apparatus to the final destination, for example, to the plasma membrane. So here we see an example of kinesin. This is kinesin. Remember the word kinetic means to move. So this molecule is kinesin and it holds on to the vesicle. And of course it's going to need energy to move and it literally walks by attaching to receptors along the microtubule cell so that it can find its final destination. Centrioles are made of nine sets of microtubule triplets. They lie at right angles in the cell centrosome and they're function is going to be in cell division. So when we get to the end of the semester, we're going to look at DNA replication and cell division. We'll look at more detail at the centrioles then. We find centrioles in animal cells. They are not present in plant cells. So here you can see the centrioles. There's a pair of centrioles in a centrosome. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, um, they are made of microtubules, just like the cytoskeleton. And the microtubules come together to make it make triplets. These triplets are going to be joined here uh, in the center. Cilia and flagella are structures that allow uh, organisms to move. Now we know that flagella are found in prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes, but cilia are only found in eukaryotes. Eukaryotic flagella are different from prokaryotic flagella, both in structure and function. First off, prokaryotes are much smaller, so we can't see their flagella with a light microscope. The prokaryotic flagella also move uh, around a pivot, so they move more like an oar. Eukaryotic flagella move in a wave-like motion called undulation. Flagella, <coughs> excuse me, flagella on cells are long and few, whereas cilia, found only in eukaryotes, are going to be short and many. 
Psyllium and flagella are both used to allow cells to move. So in lab, you saw paramecium. Paramecium moves because it has flagella. The, uh, I'm sorry, it has cilia. The uh, bacteria that you saw, prokaryotes, they didn't seem to be moving around a lot, but they are, those, that organism is modal and it has flagella, but you can't see those flagella. They're far too small to be seen with a light microscope. Cilia and flagella also can be used for movement uh, of the cell or fluids past the cell. So when we were looking at the stentor in lab, uh, that large trumpet-like organism, you saw the cilia spinning around and around and everything in the vicinity of the uh, organism was just spinning uh, wildly and coming toward the stentor. So it's allowing fluids to move past the cell. We have cilia on our respiratory epithelial cells and these cilia actually move uh, our mucus up and, and out and then it gets swallowed and uh, this is going to help prevent uh, pollution and bacteria viruses from getting into our lungs. The construction of cilia and flagella in eukaryotes is very similar. We call it a 9 plus 2 pattern of microtubules. So here are those cilia I was talking about in the respiratory epithelial cells. Here we see flagella of sperm. And then we can see right here the structure of a flagellum in a eukaryote. Now eukaryotic flagella are surrounded by plasma membrane. That makes them rather unique. They also have these 9 plus 2 arrangements. So here we have 9 pairs of microtubules on the outside plus a pair on the inside and that's why it's called a 9.2 okay so we have nine excuse me nine doublets and then a central microtubules of which there are two there are also little arms uh, that connect these doublets and these these are made of the motor protein called dynin so this dynin actually climbs up the adjacent microtubule doublet uh, almost like a rock climber would. And as it climbs up and it climbs down and climbs up and it climbs down, it causes the flagellum to start to undulate or move in a wave-like fashion. Okay. Outside of the eukaryotic cell, we can find cell walls, uh, not in animals, of course, but, but in plants. The primary cell wall is made of cellulose fibrils and also some non-cellulose substances, and the wall stretches when it is growing. Some plant cells also have secondary cell walls that forms inside the primary cell wall, and we see this in woody plants. There is a molecule in there called lignin. And plant cells have to talk to one another. They have cell walls. So in order for them to communicate with one another, they're connected by channels. These little tunnels or channels are called plasmodesmata. The plasmodesmata are for exchange of water and small solutes between cells. So here you can see two plant cells and there are these little tunnels connecting them here in the middle. These are the plasmodesmata. So the plasmodesmata can allow the cells to share cytoplasm, can also allow the, the, shell, the cells to share nutrients and also hormones. Plants need hormones in order to grow. Animal cells don't have a cell wall, remember, but they do have an extracellular matrix. There's something out there uh, to keep the cell hydrated, keep it from drying out. So it's usually a meshwork of fibrous proteins and polysaccharides. Collagen and elastin are two of these proteins that, that we see. Um, uh, collagen is a polysaccharide. Uh, collagen is a, mo is a molecule that is found underneath our skin and it keeps our skin looking nice and smooth. And as we get older, the collagen sort of smushes down like a, a, a polyester pillow. And as it smushes down, then the skin over the top gets wrinkly. Elastin is one of these molecules also in our skin that helps our skin to stretch. It can be overstretched, and that leads to stretch marks. So the extracellular matrix is going to vary a great deal among the cells. Flexible, for example, in cartilage, but it's going to be hard in bone. Here we can see uh, an artist's rendering of some of these molecules that are found outside of the um, plasma membrane in eukaryotic cells. Here we see an elastic fiber. Here we go. An elastic fiber. Here you see some collagen. There's some polysaccharide molecules in there. They're going to be hydrated. They're going to hold on to water. And it's going to provide an aqueous environment for the cell. As I mentioned before, cells have to talk to each other and cells have to act together when they are in an organ. So one of the things that might join to cells together is called an adhesion junction. 
This is an internal cytoplasmic plaque that is joined by intracellular filaments. Now this allows uh, cells to come together in a sturdy but a flexible sheet. And we find this in tissues that have to stretch. So the heart, for example, has to stretch as, as it is beating. The bladder stretches as it fills up with urine. So these adhesion junctions are gonna, going to hold these cells together in the organs, but allow them to stretch. And here you can see this plaque that is sort of like a button. So it's buttoning these uh, cells together. And there are filaments of the cytoskeleton that are added to it. And there's going to be always an intracellular space in between the two. So adhesion junctions are going to be in stretchy tissues. Tight junctions, on the other hand, are going to be more like zippers, and they're going to prevent material from getting across. So plasma membrane proteins are going to attach to one another, almost like belts wrapping around or zippers wrapping around these cells. So we find these between cells of tissues that serve as barriers, such as the blood-brain barrier. Very few molecules can get into the brain, only very small molecules, of course, carbon dioxide and oxygen, and then um, glucose is one of the molecules that can get across the blood-brain barrier. And so can a number of uh, illicit drugs as well as alcohol. Alcohol can cross the blood-brain bar barrier. It's a small molecule. We also find tight junctions in the kidney tubules because the kidneys are responsible for filtering out waste. So we say that these tight junctions are occluding. Occluding means that it will prevent the passage of molecules. Then there are gap junctions. Gap junctions allow cells to communicate through little channels. So they're like hollow rivets, and materials can go through these hollow rivets. They're going to give strength, but they'll allow small molecules and ions to pass through. This is important in heart muscle because this permits the flow of ions needed for the nerve conduction or nerve, uh, the contraction of the heart, which is mediated by um, the nerve conduction. And that's all we've got.